Hi there. This is for One Chapter Wednesday, and this is called uh, the Theodore Boone Kid Lawyer. This is a series by John Grisham, and he is a famous adult author as well. He has many books. He has wrote many books, and um, they have been created into movies. And um, if you love mysteries, this adventure, this would be an awesome series for you. All right, One Chapter Wednesday, Chapter 1. Theodore Boone was an only child, and for that reason, usually he had breakfast alone. His father, a busy lawyer, was in the habit of leaving early and meeting friends for coffee and gossip at the same downtown diner every morning at 7. Theo's mother, herself a busy lawyer, had been trying to lose 10 pounds for at least the past 10 years, and because of this, she convinced herself that breakfast should be nothing more than coffee with the newspaper. So, he ate by himself at the kitchen table, cold cereal and orange juice, with an eye on the clock. The Boone home had clocks everywhere, clear evidence of organized people. Actually, he wasn't completely alone. Beside his chair, his dog ate too. Judge was a thoroughly mixed mutt whose age and breeding would be always a mystery. Theo had rescued him from near death with a last second appearance in animal court two years earlier and Judge would always be grateful. He preferred Cheerios, same as Theo, and they ate together in silence every morning. At 8 a.m., Theo rinsed their bowls in the sink, placed the milk and juice back in the fridge, walked to the den, and kissed his mother on the cheek. Off to school, he said. Do you have lunch money, she asked. The same question five mornings a week. Always. And your homework is complete? It's perfect, Mom. I'll see you when? I'll stop by the office after school. Theo stopped by the office every day after school without fail, but Mrs. Boone always asked. Be careful, she said, and remember to smile. The braces on his teeth had now been in place for over two years, and Theo wanted desperately to get rid of them. In the meantime, though, his mother continually reminded him to smile and make the world a happier place. I'm smiling, Mom. Love you, Teddy. Love you back. Theo, still smiling in spite of being called Teddy, flung his backpack across his shoulders, scratched uh, Judge on the head, and said goodbye, then left through the kitchen door. He hopped on his bike and was soon speeding down Mallard Lane, a narrow leafy street in the oldest section of town. He waved at Mr. Nunnery, who was already on his porch and settled in for another long day of watching what little traffic found its way into the neighborhood and he whisked by Mrs. Goodlow at the curb without speaking because she lost her hearing and most of her mind as well. He did smile at her, though, but she did not return the smile. Her teeth were somewhere in the house. It was early spring, and the air was crisp and cool. Theo pedaled quickly, the wind stinging his face. Homeroom was at 840, and he had important matters before school. He cut through the side streets, darted down an alley, dodged some traffic, and ran a stop sign. This was Theo's turf, the route he traveled every day. After four blocks, the houses gave way to offices and shops and stores. The county courthouse was the largest building in downtown Strattenburg. The post office was second, the library third. It sat majestically on the north side of Main Street, halfway between a bridge over the river and a park filled with gazebos and bird baths and monuments to those killed in wars. Theo loved the courthouse with its air of authority and people hustling importantly about and somber notices and schedules tackled or tacked to the bulletin boards. Most of all, Theo loved the courtrooms themselves. There were small ones where more private matters were handled without juries. There was the main courtroom on the second floor where the lawyers battled like gladiators and judges ruled like kings. At the age of 13, Theo was still undecided about his future. One day, he dreamed of being a famous trial lawyer, one who handled the biggest cases and never lost before juries. The next day, he dreamed of being a great judge, noted for his wisdom and fairness. He went back and forth, changing his mind daily. The main lobby was already busy on this Monday morning, as if the lawyers and their clients wanted, to, wanted an early start to the week. There was a crowd waiting by the elevator, so Theo raced up two flights of stairs and down the east wing where family court was held. His mother was a noted divorce lawyer, one who always represented the wife, and Theo knew this area of the building well. Since divorce trials were decided by judges, 
juries were not used. And since most judges preferred not to have large groups or spectators observing such sensitive matters, the courtroom was small. By its door, several lawyers huddled importantly, obviously not agreeing on much. Theo searched the hallway, then turned a corner and saw his friend. She was sitting on one of the old wooden benches, alone, small and frail and nervous. When she saw him, he smiled and put a hand over her mouth. Theo hustled over and sat next to her, very closely, knees touching. With any other girl, he would have placed himself at least two feet away and prevented any chance of contact. But April Thinmore was not just any girl. They had started pre-kindergarten together at the age of four at a nearby church school, and they had been close friends since they could remember. It wasn't a romance. They were too young for that. Theo did not know of a single 13-year-old boy in his class who admitted to having a girlfriend. Just the opposite. They wanted nothing to do with them, and the girls felt the same way. Theo had been warned that things would change and, dr and dramatically, but that seemed unlikely. April was just a friend, and one in a great deal of need at the moment. Her parents were divorcing, and Theo was extremely grateful his mother was not involved with the case. The divorce was no surprise to anyone who knew the Finmores. April's father was an eccentric antiques dealer and the drummer for an old rock band that still played in nightclubs and toured for weeks at a time. Her mother raised goats and made goat cheese, but she peddled around town in a converted funeral hearse, painted bright yellow. An ancient spider monkey with gray whiskers rode shotgun and munched on the cheese, which had never really sold very well. Mrs. Boone, or Mr. Boone, had once described the family as non-traditional, which Theo took to mean downright weird. Both their parents had been arrested on drug charges, though neither had served time. Are you okay? Theo asked. No, she said. I hate being here. She had an older brother named August and an older sister named March, and both fled the family. August left the day after he graduated from high school. March dropped out at the age of 16 and left town, leaving April as the only child for her parents to torment. Theo knew all of this because April told him everything. She had to. She needed someone outside of her family to confide in, and Theo was her listener. I don't want to live with either one of them, she said. It was a terrible thing to say about one's parents, but Theo understood completely. He despised her parents for the way they treated her. He despised them for the chaos of their lives, for their neglect of April, for their cruelty to her. Theo had long had a long list of grudges against Mr. and Mrs. Finmore. He would run away before being forced to live there. He did not know of a single kid in town who ever set foot inside the Finmore home. The divorce trial was in its third day, and April would soon be called to the witness stand to testify. The judge would ask her the fateful question, April, which parent do you want to live with? And she did not know the answer. She had discussed it for hours with Theo, and she still did not know what to say. The great question in Theo's mind was, why did either parent want custody of April? Each had neglected her in so many ways. He had heard many stories, but he had never repeated a single one. What are you going to say? He asked. I'm telling the judge that I want to live with my aunt Peg in Denver. I thought she said no. She did. Then you can't say that. What can I say, Theo? My mother would say that you should choose your mother. I know she's not your first choice, but you don't have a first choice. But the judge can do whatever he wants, right? Right. If you were 14, you can make a binding decision. At 13, the judge will only consider your wishes. According to my mother, this judge almost never awards custody to the father. Play it safe. Go with your mother. April wore jeans, hiking boots, and a navy sweater. She rarely dressed like a girl, but her gender was never in doubt. She wiped a tear from her cheek, but managed to keep her composure. Thanks, Theo, she said. I wish I could stay, and I wish I could go to school. They both managed to force laugh. I'll be thinking about you. Be strong. Thanks, Theo. His favorite judge was the Honorable Henry Gantry, and he entered the great man's outer office at 20 minutes after 8 a.m. Well, good morning, Theo, Mrs. Hardy said. She was stirring something into her coffee and preparing to begin her work. Morning, Mrs. Hardy, Theo said with a smile. And what do we owe this honor? 
she asked. She was not quite as old as Theo's mother, he guessed, and she was very pretty. Theo, she was Theo's favorite of all the secretaries in the courthouse. His favorite clerk was Jenny over in family court. I need to see Judge Gantry, he replied. Is he in? Well, yes, but he's very busy. Please, I'll just take a minute. She sipped her coffee, then asked, Does this have anything to do with the big trial tomorrow? Yes, ma'am, it does. I like for my government class to watch the first day of the trial, but I gotta make sure there'll be enough seats. Oh, I don't know about that, Theo, Mrs. Hardy said, frowning and shaking her head. We're expecting an overflow crowd. Seating will be tight. Can I talk to the judge? How many are in your class? Sixteen. I thought maybe we could sit in the balcony. She was still frowning as she picked up the phone and pushed the button. She waited for a second, then said, Yes, Judge Theodore. Yes, Judge. Theodore Boone is here and would like to see you. I told him you were very busy. She listened some more, then put down the phone. Hurry, she said, pointing to the judge's door. Seconds later, Theo stood before the biggest desk in town, a desk covered with all sorts of papers and files and thick binders, a desk that symbolized the enormous power held by Judge Henry Gantry, who, at the moment, was not smiling. In fact, Theo was certain the judge had not cracked a smile since he interrupted his work. Theo, though, was pressing hard with a prolonged flash of metal from ear to ear. Stay your case, Judge Gantry said. Theo had heard him issue this command on many occasions. He'd seen lawyers, good lawyers, rise and stutter and search for words while Judge Gantry scowled down from the bench. He wasn't scowling now, nor was he wearing his black robe, but he was still intimidating. As Theo cleared his throat, he saw an unmistakable twinkle in his friend's eye. Yes, sir. Well, my government teacher is Mr. Mount, and Mr. Mount thinks we might get approval from the principal for an all-day field trip to watch the opening of the trial tomorrow. Theo paused, took a deep breath, told himself again to speak clearly, slowly, forcefully, like all great trial lawyers. But we need guaranteed seats. I was thinking we could sit in the balcony. Oh, you were? Yes, sir. How many? Sixteen plus Mr. Mount. The judge picked up a file, opened it, and began reading as if he'd suddenly forgotten about Theo standing at attention across the desk. Theo waited for an awkward 15 seconds, then the judge abruptly said, 17 seats from balcony, left side. I'll tell the bailiff to sit you to seat you at 10 minutes before 9 tomorrow. I expect perfect behavior. No problem, sir. I'll have Mrs. Handy email a note to your principal. Thanks, judge. You can go now, Theo. Sorry to be so busy. No problem, sir. Theo was scurrying toward the door when the judge said, Say, Theo, do you think Mr. Duffy is guilty? Theo stopped, turned around, and without hesitating, he responded, He's presumed innocent. Got that. But what's your opinion as to his guilt? I think he did it. The judge nodded slightly but gave no indication of whether he agreed. What about you? Theo asked. Finally, a smile. I'm, I'm a fair and impartial referee, Theo. I have no preconceived notions of guilt or innocence. That's what I thought you'd say. See you tomorrow, Theo cracked the door and hustled out. Mrs. Hardy was on her feet, hands on hips, stirring down two flustered lawyers who were demanding to see the judge. All three clammed up when Theo walked out of Judge Gantry's office. He smiled at Mrs. Handy as he walked hurriedly by. Thanks, he said as he opened the door and disappeared. So again, if you're interested in reading um, the Theodore Bone series, Kid Lawyer is the first one. I have them on top of my bookcase. Um, so please feel free to take a book and enjoy. Remember, good readers are always kind of writing or jotting down some things that they would like to talk about. Happy reading.